Good morning. Good morning. We were last at chapter 16 of the book of Ezekiel. Uh, however, we had not completed that chapter. In this chapter, it, it is about the parable of the faithless wife. And we covered the first two points, the girl child, the abandoned child, and then the passerby. The abandoned child was so uh, pitiful, so helpless, but the passerby had compassion and took to the child, nursed the child, fed the child, and the child grew from infancy to adulthood, ready for marriage. And the passerby, who is God, right? Picture of God, uh, uh, sanctified this child, cleansed this child, prepared this child well. And we read in verse 14, Your fame went out among the nations because of your beauty, for it was perfect through my splendor which I have bestowed on you, says the Lord. So, it pointed to a time when Israel was glorious in splendor. The peak was when Solomon was on the throne and uh, the empire who, which was captured by David expanded quite a wide territory and they were just majestic. That was the peak of the history of Israel. And that was the and that was uh, what we see of the girl child, the passerby and the husband. So what we have seen is someone who had nothing to someone who had everything. So from nothing to everything. And that should end with, I mean, if you write any storybook, like end up like the, uh, and they live happily ever after, right? From nothing to everything. But the story doesn't end there. And so we continue and to look at the remaining parts of this chapter 16. So Father, we come to you once again. Your word says that wisdom rests in the heart of those with understanding. And understanding comes from the knowledge of your word, that we may know you and know your will. So Father, we surrender ourselves to you, we submit ourselves to you. Teach us once again your word and your truth, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, now we are looking at verse 15. The adulteress. The adulteress. I mean, if you have been treated so well, plucked from the street, and, and, and you, you, you have been so well nursed and fed and provided for, you should just be faithful and stay with the one, right? But man is different, right? Verse 15, But you trusted in your own beauty, played the harlot because of your fame, and poured out your harlotry on everyone passing by who would have it by passing by who would have it because those who pass by they they don't have it they envy you they want to have what you have but you got it you took some of your garments and adorned multi-colored high places for yourself and played the harlot on them such things should not happen nor be you have also taken your beautiful jewelry from my gold and my silver which I have given you and made for yourself male images and played the harlot with them you took your embroidered garments and covered them and you set my oil and my incense before them also my food which I gave you the pastry of fine flour oil and honey which I fed you you set it before them as sweet incense, and so it was, says the Lord God. So without too much uh, elaboration, from verse 15 to 19, it is very clear. Now that she is savouring the beauty, the splendour, the luxury of what God gave to her, we read, right? God says, it's my gold, it's my silver, my oil, my what? 
So all that she had was from God. And you gave that which God gave to you, you gave it to the idols. You made them into images and, and you go up to high places and the food which I gave you, you offered to idols. You follow? It is so sad. I mean, even as a, as a parent, I mean, you work day and night, you toil and, and you save and you scrum here and there so that you have less, but your kids will have more. Trusting that they will remain pious, um, uh, they will show filial piety and be, will honor you as a parent, you know. But instead, their loyalty went to the neighbor. Whatever you gave, went to the neighbors and beyond the neighborhood, how would you feel? My God would feel angry fight if there is such a word. Okay? So verse 20. Moreover, you took your sons and your daughters whom you bore to me, and this you sacrificed to them to be devoured. You bore to me. That means who own the kids who own the children who has uh, you know ownership over them god every good gift every perfect gift is from god yeah and the fruitfulness of the womb is a gift from god so every child you bear it is god's but what do you do you participated in, in those child sacrifice you sacrifice to them, to the idols, to be devoured. Were your acts of harlotry a small matter? Were they? No. And if you look at the Northern Kingdom, you look at the Northern Kingdom and also a bit in the Southern Kingdom and so on, um, it has been happening throughout the history of Israel. They have been taking to the worship of the uh, people in Canaan. And they offer to Molech child sacrifice. Verse 22, let me finish reading one. That you have slain my children and offered them, offered them up to them by causing them to pass through the fire. And in all your abominations and acts of harlotry, you did not remember the days of your youth when you were naked and bare and struggling in your blood. Do you remember, God is saying, do you remember in verse 2 and verse 3 and so on, when you were born, you were out there in the field, the first five verses in fact, you were so helpless. Nothing was done, nothing was done that would have been done to preserve a child after the child is born. You will not wrap your 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 biblical uh, whatever cord is is not cut. Yeah. You not no salt was rubbed on you and so on and so forth. Things which a mother would do or a midwife would do when the child is born. Nothing was done to keep you alive. You were left to die. But I save you. You were saved. But you are not doing the same. You are not doing the same for these little boys and girls whom you bear, whom you gave birth to. So you have forgotten. You have forgotten. You did not remember the days of your youth when you were struggling in your own blood, when you were naked and bare. Verse 23, Then it was so, after all your wickedness, Woe, woe to you. Woe is the opposite of blessings. So woe, woe to you, says the Lord God, that you also built for yourself a shrine and made a high place for yourself in every street. This is definitely a no-no. This is a picture, not picture. This is idolatry. You built your high places at the head of every road and made your beauty to be at poor you offered yourself to everyone who passed by and multiplied your acts of harlotry. 
So you go to some places even around this region. Wow, you go to place idol here, idol there, everywhere. You know. But this these are countries which are are, are very steep in, in all this kind of idolatry worship. And this was not to be in Israel, but there they were at every at the head of every road. That's what they did. They offered themselves to everyone who passed by and multiplied their acts of harlotry. They, that means they had many partners. Many partners. Now, wow, you mean Israel have many partners? You mean all these uh, Israeli women, they sleep around and so on? No, it is a picture of the nation. They were to fix their eyes unto Jehovah, God. But instead of looking unto God, depending on God, they look to Egypt. They look to Lebanon. They look to other countries. You follow me? They look to other countries for help, for sustenance. So that's what it means. Instead of looking unto God. Which verse? 26. 26. 26. You also committed harlotry with the Egyptians. Your very fleshly neighbors. Fle fleshly means what? Worldly. Egypt is a picture of the world. Things done in the flesh. Your very fleshy, fresh, fleshly neighbors. And increase your acts of harlotry to provoke me to anger. Behold, therefore I stretch out my hand against you, diminish your allotment, and gave you up to do, to the will of those who hate you. The daughters of the Philistines who were ashamed of your lewd behavior. You also played the harlot with the Assyrians because you were insatiable. Indeed, you played the harlot with them and still were not satisfied. Moreover, you multiplied your acts of harlotry as far as the land of the Trader, Chaldea. Chaldea is what? Babylon. And even then, you were not satisfied. So all these are the charges God pressed against the people of Israel. I, verse 27, I stretch out my hand against you. That means judgment. God pronounced a judgment against them. Diminish your allotment. That means provision. And we have studied in the other uh, earlier chapters, famine. Yeah. If famine, that means what? No food, no no water, no food. All this, you know, then the land will not be <coughs> fruitful in the season. And they have multiple partners. We just saw the Philistines. The Philistines who were ashamed of your lewd behavior. I mean, the Philistines are. Huh? Are already, I mean, when you talk about Philistines in the Bible, you know they are already categorized not good, right? Not good, right? Their behavior. You are worse than them. Poor. You understand? Huh? If somebody fail uh, by 10 marks, you fail by 20 marks. Worse than them. You also played the harlot with the Assyrians. The Assyrians were very cruel people, right? Very cruel. And you played with them and they're insatiable. They will never be satisfied. And then they play harlot with uh, the Chaldeans. And the king, one of the kings, I think it's Hezekiah. Yeah. Hey, come, come, come. Come into my temple and look at all the wonderful things we have, right? And then in 586, when Nebuchadnezzar sent his army down. They went to the temple and they already know what were in the temple and they took them. But these are sanctified items for God, I mean for, for worship unto the Lord. It is for Him. They were playing harlotry with the Chaldeans. So, verse 30. How degenerate is your heart? So the whole matter, the whole matter starts with your heart. 
It's not your eyes, what you saw. It's not your ears, what you heard. It's not what you have tasted. It all stems from your heart. And Jesus said this so well in Matthew chapter 15. Verse 19. Matthew 15. Verse 19. For out of the heart, for out of the heart proceed evil. For out of the heart proceed. Hey, let me read it. Proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, tests, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. So evil, God is Jesus is saying evil comes from within. From the heart. So check your heart. Check your heart. If it is in the right place, of course it is in the right place, right? But whether it is set on the things of God. So, back to Ezekiel chapter 16. How degenerate is your heart? Verse 30 says the Lord God, seeing you do all these things, the deeds of a brazen harlot. Brazen means what? Hardcore. Hardcore. Hardcore harlot. You erected your shrine at the head of every road and built your high place in every street. Yet you were not like a harlot because you scorn payment. Ah, what God is going to say now, it is terrible. What we are reading from verse 15 to verse 34, it is about the adulterers. And what God is describing here is really shameful. That's why they, they are worse than their neighbors. Because a harlot is, I provide service to pay me. Right? That's how a harlot does business. Huh? But what Israel did was, I provide service, I pay you to come so I can provide service to you. You understand? I pay you to come so that I can provide service. So instead of people paying for your service, you are paying for them to have service with you. So let's read again. Yet you were not like a harlot because you scorned payment. I don't want payment. That's what they, they say. You are an adulterous wife who takes strangers instead of her husband. Men make payment to all harlots, but you made your payments to all your lovers and hired them to come to you from all around for your harlotry. You are the opposite of other women in your harlotry because no one solicited you to be a harlot in that you gave payment, but no payment was given you. Therefore, you are the opposite. They went so low. They went so low. It is really inverting the client relationship with them. You know, by the way, you're good. You understand, you get the picture, so I will not elaborate. So, verse 35 to 43, the false lovers. Now then, O harlot, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, because the, your filthiness was poured out and your nakedness uncovered in your harlotry with your lovers and with all your abominable idols, and because of the blood of your children which you gave to them, the sacrificed children. Surely, therefore, I will gather all your lovers with whom you took pleasure, all those you loved, and all those you hated. I will gather them from around, all around against you and will uncover your nakedness to them that they may see all your nakedness. That means of going 
back to the beginning because when God first found her, she was naked. She had nothing. Now she is going back to nothingness. And I will judge you as women who break wet law and shed blood are judged. And I will judge you as women who break wet law or shed blood are judged. If you are adulterous under the law, you will be stoned to death. That is judgment. Death penalty. I will bring blood upon you in fury and jealousy. I will also give you into their hand and they shall throw down your shrines and break down your high places. They shall also strip you of your clothes, take your beautiful jewelry and leave you naked and bare. And this is back to verse 4 and verse 5 at the beginning of this chapter when this infant child, newly born, was naked and bare. <coughs> so for some people, rags to riches uh, is a cycle. They got nothing, they work hard, they get money, then they squander, gamble, casino, the Sentosa, then back to zero again. Then start now. Set back to the beginning. They shall also bring up an assembly against you, and they shall stone you with stones, and thrust you through with their swords. Did it not happen? It did. The Syrians were rough on them. The Babylonians were rough on them. They shall burn your houses with fire, and execute judgments on you in the sight of many women. And I will make you cease playing the harlot, and you shall no longer hire lovers. Because now you are so bare and naked, no money, nothing to attract, nothing to pay your lovers. They won't come to you. So you shall no longer hire lovers. So I will lay to rest my fury toward you, and my jealousy shall depart from you. I will be quiet and be angry no more. Verse 43 Because you did not remember the days of your youth, but agitated me with all these things, surely I will recompense, I will pay you back. I will recompense your deeds on your own head, says the Lord God. And you shall not commit lewdness in addition to all your abominations. So, this punishment, this judgment is sure. And it's going to be hard. Because the wages of sin is death. And if they persist in spite of, in spite of God's long-suffering and patience with them, and if they persist in turning their backs to Him, this is the judgment. They will be punished. So, now we look at the two sisters. So, who are these two sisters? Israel got two sisters. Now, these are just pictures. One is of Samaria in the north, and one is Sodom in the south. So, if they are sisters, that means there are three sisters here. Israel, Samaria, Sodom. And if you read from Genesis onwards, historically, they were related. They were related. They, they, there is Jewish blood. So, in short, they were relatives. You understand? Yeah. Like there is also like Edom. The Edomites came from Esau. Also got something like Moabites. You know Moabites? Moabites, Moab. Because uh, no, no, uh, who, who got drunk? Uh, no. Noah, Noah got drunk. Yeah. Noah got drunk, and then the daughters want to help. Yeah. And from there, you have Moab. Yeah. And then you also have the Ammonites. So all these are relatives. So here we are looking at the, the sisters. Verse 44. Indeed, Everyone who quotes Proverbs 
will use this proverb against you. Like mother, like daughter. Wow, and all the men say Amen. But every time we get scolding, yeah, like father, like son. Right? Now it's like mother, like daughter. And why so? Because these children that were raised, you can see the traits of their parents. Because the parents were not teaching them the right things. And if you're not teaching them the right things, then your children will learn the wrong things that they see in their parents. And here, the though it is written like mother, like daughter, but you know, it's not just mother. Fathers also have a responsibility. Yeah. If you don't have, uh, I mean, if the parents don't uh, have honesty in them, no integrity, do you know what the, the kids will, will, will learn? Same thing. Yeah. If, if you uh, you show apathy towards the things of God, don't want to go to church, don't read the Bible, don't do anything, what do you think your children will do? Follow you. So, like mother, like daughter. You are your mother's daughter, loathing husband and children, and you are the sister of your sisters who loathe their husbands and children. Your mother was a Hittite and your father was an Amorite. So you have uh, neglected your husband, neglected your children. So verse 46, the Hittite and the Amorite one, we already explained when we started this chapter. Just that historically, that land which they were, were occupied by the Hittites and the Amorites. And God is saying, it's like, you, you are like them. But they are not, they, they, come, from, they come from Abraham. Mm -hmm. But God is just saying, your mother was a Hittite and your father was an Amorite. Like the people of this land in the past. Verse 46, your sister is Samaria in the north who dwells with your daughters to the north of you and your younger sister who dwells to the south of you is Sodom and her daughters. You did not walk in their ways nor act according to their abominations. Wow, this sentence should have a full stop here and it will be so wonderful. You did not walk like your sisters in Samaria and Sodom did. You did not act like them according to their abominations, to, to all the idolatries and things that displeased God. You did not. Wow, sounds good, right? But let's finish the second part of the sentence, of the verse. But as if that were too little, you became more corrupt than they in all your ways. If they have been rejecting me, you are worse. If they have been worshipping idols, you are worse. You follow me? Mm -hmm. Israel was worse than her sisters. Verse 48, As I live, says the Lord God, neither your sister Sodom nor your daughters have done as you and your daughters have done. Look, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. So what was the sin of Sodom in the south? She and her daughter had pride, fullness of food and abundance of idleness. Neither did she strengthen the left the hand of the poor and needy. And they were haughty, prideful and committed abomination before me. Therefore I took them away as I saw fit. These people in Sodom, they had more to live on, more abundance, abundance. But they got nothing to live for. They are not living for God. They were living for themselves. That's what prideful people are. It's I, it's me, it's mine. What I have, I want more. What you have, I also want. So these are the prideful people. So the sin of Sodom is the sin of pride. Next, we go to Samaria, verse 51. Samaria did not commit half of your sins. What? 
if you commit 10 sins, uh, Israel, Samaria only committed 5. That's what they mean. Samaria did not commit half of your sins, but you have multiplied your abominations more than they, and have justified your sisters by all the abominations which you have done. You have justified your sisters by all the abominations which you have done. Justified means what? Just as if you have not sinned. By your sins, Israel, you make Samaria and Sodom look like they never sinned. Okay, I put it in simple English. Huh? Comparing with you, huh? your sisters are angels. Huh? You understand? Huh? Comparing with you, huh? Samaria and Sodom, huh? even though they are into idolatry, abominations, and but compared to you, they are angels. Uh, you are terrible. That's what God is saying. You, who judge your sisters, bear your own shame also, because the sins which you committed were more abominable than theirs. They are more righteous than you. Yes, be disgraced also, and bear your own shame, because you justified your sisters verse 52 you judge your sisters now do you remember do you remember, in the gospel even jesus uh, had to go to samaria to the woman in the well but the jews the jews normally will not go to samaria. they will try and avoid samaria if they go to the north they try and flank go by the side they don't want to go through samaria but Samaria is the most convenient way because from Jerusalem they just go up north. But they don't want to go through Samaria. Why? They think uh, these people are not the right breed. Because over the years, Jews uh, had intermarried with foreigners, the Syrians and so on. And uh, they are mixed blood, so to speak. Mixed blood, not pure. So, don't want to have anything to do with them. Okay, okay, they are not pure, you are pure. But then, are, are, you, are you then following the commandments of God? But you are not. You are worse than them. So God, God is not looking at the external. God is looking at the internal. Their heart was degenerated. You justify your sisters. So don't judge your sisters. So that's why Paul wrote, Judge not lest you be judged, right? Verse 53. When I bring back their captives, the captives, now we come to the last part, the restoration. When I bring back their captives, the captives of Sodom and her daughters, and the captives of Samaria and her daughters, then I will also bring back the captives of your captivity among them, that you may bear your own shame and be disgraced by all that you did when you comforted them. Now what we are reading here from verse 53 to 63 uh, is as what I mentioned during the Bible discovery when we covered the Old Testament, when we came to the prophets. The things, I mean, if you want to see a certain pattern, a certain format in studying the prophet, is this. First is about judges, no, about threats and judgments. The threats of enemies coming to punish them, to judge them under the direction of God. Second one is uh, the call to repentance. So God used the prophets to tell people, please turn around, you turn, repent, and God will relent, God will forgive you. Then the third one is promise of restoration. Now, no matter how angry God was with them, no matter how much He wants to punish them, you read everywhere, even in the prophets, and even now here as we read 17, it's somehow after the judgment, God stands ready to receive His people to restore them. It is He, he disciplines them. He punished them to discipline them. He did not punish them to destroy them. So this is a God of mercy, of grace, yeah, of many chances. So He 
now stand ready. He said, when I bring back the captives, I mean the people in Samaria, are they angels, so to speak? They are not. But the day will come, I will bring them back. I will also bring the people back from Sodom. And I also bring you back, Israel, Judah, from the north. When you were under, when you were under the Babylonian captivity. Verse 55. When your sisters, Sodom and her sisters, return to their former state, and Samaria and her daughters return to their former state, then you and your daughters will return to your former state. Now, that means what? Go back to where you were before. God will receive you. You know the liberals? Liberals in the U.S. Huh? Liberals, that means they like to stretch. They, they, they don't like rules. They don't like restriction. They like to say, God can do a few more things. <laughs> God, I uh, once say, always say, uh, nobody. Uh, you marry, divorce, marry again, divorce. It's okay. Great. We have seen abound, grace abound even more. Yeah. Um, these are liberals. Are the conservatives very orthodox? Or not? No. You sin one time, or take stone, throw you, show you must make you die, you must be punished. No mercy. To that also, Jesus said, Hey, the Pharisees, you all know the word so long, you know this, you know that, you tie everything. Good, good, good. But got mercy, no? No mercy. Not good. Okay. The liberals. The liberals, even in, in, in some places today, they use this verse when your sister Sodom and their daughters and Samaria and their daughters return and you return to your former state. They are saying, don't worry. Once safe, always safe. So even if you fall away, you, you after you, you receive Christ as your Lord and Savior and you go back to the world and do all the kind of thing, the Word of God says, one day, you will all come back to God. You will make it to heaven. Don't worry. That is false teaching. That is false teaching. This is not talking about the returning of the people per se. It is re talking about the place. Talking about returning to the city. The city of Jerusalem. Because when the people shall return, it's not the same people. Because it is generations later, after these people have been sent into exile, the subsequent generations come back. So it's not talking about the same people who went there and came back. But the point here is, they come back to Jerusalem. Because you all have been uh, 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 unrighteous, you all have been disobedient, I send you out of the land. But ultimately, I will bring you back to the land. But they are not the same people. In any case, the people who came back from Babylonian captivity was only like 40 something thousand. Out of the millions who went, a couple of million who went. So it is not talking about the same people. It's talking about the place that God said, okay, you can come back to my city, Jerusalem. Verse 56 For your sister, Sodom, was not a byword in your mouth. Byword is like a proverb, like a something that is used for gossip. For your sister, sister Sodom was not a byword in your mouth in the days of your pride. Because your before your wickedness was uncovered, it was like the time of the reproach of the daughters of Syria and all those around her, and of the daughters of the Philistines who despise you everywhere. You have paid for your lewdness and your abominations, says the Lord. For thus says the Lord God, I will deal with you as you have done, who despise the oath by breaking the covenant. So, they would have been punished accordingly. And when they have been punished, there will be restoration. 
So that comes to verse 16. Why the restoration? Why the restoration? Because God is a covenant keeping God. He made a covenant and He will keep it. Nevertheless, I will remember my covenant with you in the days of your youth and I will establish an ever everlasting covenant with you. I will remember my covenant with you. Is it referring to the people of Judah at that point in time? No, it is referring to the nation in the days of your youth. That means in the days past, in the days past, he had a covenant, he had a covenant with Abraham. He said, you look, from the south, yeah, until the north, Euphrates River, and so on, all this land shall be yours. Yeah. That's covenant. So if this is your land, you will come back. And I'll establish an everlasting covenant with you. So we are talking about a new covenant. You remember when we read in Jeremiah chapter 31? A new covenant. The new covenant is no longer written in stones, right? It's where? Heart. In the heart. So, God is pointing them to this. I will establish a new, a, 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 an everlasting covenant with you. And this is the new covenant. In Jeremiah 31, you can flip back when you go back. Verse 61. Then, you will remember your ways and be ashamed when you receive your older and younger sister for I will give them to you for daughters but not because of my covenant with you and I will establish my covenant with you then you shall know that I am the Lord that you may remember and be ashamed and never open your mouth anymore because of your shame because when I provide you an atonement for all you have done. Now what is this couple of verses saying? One word. Grace. Grace. Because whatever it is, whatever it is, you people are still in sin. Whatever it is, you, know, you open your mouth, you know, uh, and then if you, if, you, if you open your mouth and so on, uh, you, you just got nothing to shout about because you just came from captivity. You were living in sin. And we ask, how come you went there? I, uh, you know, you, you got to tell people, that's why, you know, people who come out from prison, they, they find it difficult to adjust back to society. You want to find a job also difficult, right? Yeah, they are all labeled and oh, what's your... Oh, yeah, then they say, oh, no, 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 cannot. Cannot work, no, 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 no. Uh, They may not tell you openly, but you know, getting a job and all, very difficult to, to fit back into society. Then how? For, looks like they are always labeled and condemned, but God say, by grace, huh? You don't need to open your mouth anymore because of your shame. When I provide you an atonement for all you have done. An atonement. Now, it is the sacrifice that will take the place of yours. Because if you want to please an angry God, hey, God, forgive me. This is my sacrifice. That is the atonement. But in the Old Testament, what they offer? Yeah. Wow, once a year, you know, they come, and they, they bring the lamb, uh, the whatever. But God is pointing to the one and only atonement. The one that sacrifice, that ends all sacrifice. The perfect lamb, Jesus Christ. When I provide you an atonement for all you have done, all they have done, forgiven and forgotten. But you, you can never pay that, that penalty of sin. And who can pay? 
only Jesus can pay. So you read again, you see, this points to the New Testament. Who will provide the atonement? God. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He sent His only Son. Because if we were to provide our own atonement, it will never, never be met. And we will still be doing it every year. They will still be doing it every year. But God said, I'll provide you an atonement, not atonements. Just one. So it points to Jesus. Okay? So to end this, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11. So as we read this, uh, we know God is not done with Israel yet. God still has plans for the future of Israel. And uh, I think a few days ago, uh, Donald Trump opened the embassy in Jerusalem, right? People, of course, protest. Uh, and I've got a a schoolmate from, from the past. Uh, he thanks us in the chat. He was on that day, he was following the Palestinians to cross into Gaza and so on. Uh, because this was the occasion when US was going to open the embassy in Jerusalem. They are going, the Palestinians are going in there to protest and, and this and that. So he was going with them. He's not a Palestinian. He's not a Muslim, he's not nothing like us, uh, you know, uh, Chinese. But he he, he, he he wears a ponytail and then he, and he went with them and they give us life cover. And, oh, I'm here, I'm crossing the border. I can't talk to you now, I'm crossing the border now. You know, oh, can you all pray for me? Uh? I think he's a believer. He said, can you all pray for me? Uh? Okay, I don't know that uh, you know, nothing happened. But you know, the next day you read the papers, actually, a lot of people died. But he is like a self-appointed journalist uh, going cross into the thing. <coughs> so, anyway, God is not done with uh, Israel yet. So, chapter 10, 1 Corinthians, verse 11. Now, all these things happen to them as examples that they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. So, all this that have been recorded, they happen, is to teach us so that we know. So you don't do the same. Obedience brings blessing. Disobedience brings force. And uh, surely you don't want to be the ungrateful child like what Israel was. Being an orphan and then after that, forget the goodness that the passerby who became the husband who provided for her and she turned around for us. So, let's have uh, a break now.